Hey, everybody, welcome to the Elseworlds Exchange. I'm Sal, and I'm joined today by Dan DiDio. Dan, how you doing, man? Good, thanks. How is everything there? It seems like you're inside, I'm outside. That works out nice. Yeah, yeah, it's fall here. I don't know, you're on the West Coast still, right? We're on the West Coast, yeah. We're expecting about, I think they're saying like 102 today, oh um, which is kind of interesting. <laughs> you know, and it's funny, it's funny, just, you just as you started talking, the wind just started up and my, my wife loves wind chimes. So I'm like, oh, I'm about to get musical on you. So <laughs> if I break out the song, just forgive yeah, me. Yeah, if you okay. feel like breaking out in the song, it'll really add to the show. So, <laughs> but yeah, man, I know it's, it's fall here. We're just, and it, it was like a light switch. It just, boom, leaves, boom, the smell, yeah. the wind, the cold, it's here. So. Yeah, no, no, I was back, I was just there, um, back in New Jersey about three, four weeks ago. Um, my uh, my younger son had their first child. Uh, him and his wife. Congratulate Mazel Tov. Yeah, second yeah second grand second grandchild. So it was a lot of fun oh. getting a chance to go back there, seeing seeing both the family for the first time since February, which was a long long haul. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah, I can't yeah, even imagine, before. man. It's just yeah. nuts. <laughs> Still, you know, today <laughs> this year. Yeah, it is. It's what it is. <laughs> yeah, it's been a hell of a year, I guess. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. But, uh, but the reason I've, I've got you here today, uh, aside from everything else, is because uh, you got some stuff coming up and I really want to talk about it because yeah. I'm honestly just kind of, because we've been coordinating a little bit and you're like, I think I got something to talk about. And I'm like, yeah, yeah. oh, now you got something to talk about? Like, it's a little bit, it's, it's, it wasn't, I was, it wasn't what I was, it's not what I was alluding to. But no, okay. sure. Uh, but, you know, but it, it's kind of fun. I mean, you know, getting started and, and doing these, uh, uh, these uh, online classes with the Cupid School is is something that I've been interested in for quite a while. It's it's so funny because I've watched so many of my uh, contemporaries and 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 a number of uh, a number of people that that I really respect really start to work in different schools. Um, a lot of uh, a lot of DC employees started teaching at SVA. Um, they did, and they did you know the number of schools and we've always tried to be very supportive of the of the school system. Yeah. Uh, really, anyway, not just to. Uh, not just to train new talent, but also to give them a perspective on the on the businesses and the sensibilities that come along with it. So that's where I was really most interested in doing this. Um, it wasn't merely just about teaching craft. There's so many people that could teach craft better than I can, but, <laughs> but putting it in context uh, and putting structure around it um, and just putting a, a slight business sense to it, not letting business lead the decisions, um, was something that I was really fascinated by having those types of conversations. And, and more importantly, that seemed to be, be what a lot of people came to me for advice for. So I figured if I could put it together in some level of curriculum, then we might be able to, to push this out, you know? And so Absolutely. It to work. Well, and you can help the most amount of people, right? Because like anybody who's interested in this class jumps in on it and it uh, highlights the Joe Kubert School, which is a really important institution and a, a foundation for the comic book industry. Uh, yeah, yeah, I mean, you know, you know, it's funny for the Kubert School for me. It's, you know, it's, I, have, I have so many levels, uh, so many emotional levels with the school, you know, as a, as a comic fan growing up, you used to see the advertisement for the school and it of seemed course. like this, you know, it seemed like this Mount Olympus approach to the secret sauce to break into comics if that's what your goal was, uh, was doing. And then, then as I progressed and I, and when I was doing some, when I was working in television, I did some side work in comics and I had done some interviews. And one of the, my biggest interviews I did was to go to the Cuba school and sit down with Joe and Adam and Andy and Erwin Hazen and a number of the teachers and just understand the whole structure of it. Yeah. And I was completely caught up with it. But then later on, as I got to know Joe personally, um, and, and I consider Andy, Andy Cuba one of my close friends, um, and as well as so many members of that family um, that I, I, I like and the school means so much. And then Anthony Marquez, who wound up purchasing it, and, uh, yeah. and Anthony was a former DC alumni. Um, just seemed like the right place and the right thing to do. And uh, you know, I, I just enjoy the people. And uh, it's just you know, I just, you know, to be honest, it's just like you know, you enjoy talking comics. You know what I mean? You get to talk comics. <laughs> Absolutely. And I'm sure you know from your from your position uh, in the comics industry, you know, it, it's it's gone from talking about the characters. In a, in a kind of disassociated way, like, oh, like nebulously, Superboy's this, Superman's that, Batman does this, yeah. to kind of having to dictate, or anything you say about those characters is gonna be taken to a position of like, is that what Dan wants me to do with these characters? Is that what we're supposed yeah. to know? Is, that where, is he trying to tell me that's where they're going? Like, it's 3D chess, as opposed to just being like, boy, I wonder what's gonna happen to Spider-Man tomorrow, or Superman, or Batman, or anything like yeah, that. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's interesting because, um, you know, just follow the whole progression of the comic business and how it's moved along and grown over the years. Um, you know, I equated a lot to sports and sporting events. And, and if you look at the editorial position as the equivalent of a, a manager or a coach of a sport, sporting 
team. You know, if you go back 20, 30, 40 years, their role was significantly different than it is now. And, and it's much more of a collaborative process now than more of a di dictatorial process. So it's important for you to really work hand in hand with the talent, understand what their needs are, as well as what your character's needs are, and trying to find the right mesh and the, and the right alchemy is really more interesting than just trying to dictate down everything that you're trying to accomplish. I know that uh, uh, in, in my position, as a commentator on comics, uh, one of the darlings of our live shows is playing the the the, the NFL draft. Is being yeah. like just is is about that alchemy, like you say. Grab yeah. the this creator plus this creator plus these characters equals profit, yes. uh, or at least success. Yeah. And uh, and and I wonder how much of that is true, and how much of that is like, yeah, that's that's one factor, but it's it's a it's it's so much more complicated. Well, if you want to keep with the sports analogies, I'll say the same thing. Please, yeah. it's like getting a, a free agent sometimes, and sometimes they work out, and sometimes they go bust. Um, you know, and you know, and it looks. I mean, like I say sometimes that sometimes those um, those fantasy teams look good on paper, but don't really play out. Yeah, and sometimes it's the rookies are the ones that deliver the most because they're the most hungry. That's so, right. That's where, that's why it's the idea of going to the schools and trying to train them correctly in the ideas. And more importantly, understand, I'm, I'm real, what's most fascinating to me when I like talking to people is I understand, I understand what their goals are, what their interests are. Why are they getting into this? Don't tell me you're just doing it because you, you want to work in comics or, you know, I just want to make sure Spider-Man's protected for the rest of his life by right. me writing him. <laughs> Fair enough. Um, it's really more about what you're trying to accomplish for yourself and then how do, how do you work through the company and the, the characters to accomplish your goals as well as the goals that the company and the characters need to accomplish too. I think you that's... can find a way to service everyone. That's, that's the big win. Mm. I, I think that's such a, such a truism. It's so important that like one of the misconceptions uh, from fan to book is this like, misunderstanding of how the industry works and it's not necessarily because of a fundamental like miscalculation it's more like just a lack of information and a lack of exposure and one of the big changes i think that you were talking about with respect to being an editor 30 years ago versus now and in the industry itself is the veil has kind of been lifted you know it used to be i'm sure and i would love to hear some you know some of your own personal anecdotes about the subject where you know you hear stories about like the jim shooter era of yeah. Marvel. But you don't really know because he never tweeted anything about it. There was never a leak or anything. You know, yeah. you heard about something 30, 40 years later. Yeah. yeah. But nowadays, at this point, everybody knows everything. You can, talk, you can talk to a creator immediately. You can get a response. You know why they feel politically. The whole yeah. thing has kind of been, like the whole facade has kind of, has kind of dropped. I'm, I'm laughing. I said, obviously, you never read the comics journal growing up. <laughs> right. Well, it's true. Yeah. Well, I, I was not old enough. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's where everybody aired their grievances it was a, it was fun to think to it was a fun thing to watch and actually for me it added to some of the mystique behind the scene behind the veil yeah um and and it, it, it also because it's you know when the comic fan kicks in when you're working one of the first things i did was there was a bunch of like mystery stories or untold stories that you you create your own conspiracy theories of how things certainly came about yep so i i, I actually did some behind the scene churching and i found out most of the time it's mostly by accident and design and <laughs> certain things happen you know and yeah it's a little disappointing but actually it's a little heartening too because you, you'd hate to think that these people were manipulating things so much in so many ways but it was actually just just the way things worked in those days um right but it, it, it's, it, it's fun to watch. Uh, and I, like I said, I spent a lot of time in my earlier days just studying and understanding the craft of comics. Um, you know, I, I was a big enjoyer of all the various fan zines. I love the behind the scenes as much as I love the comics themselves. So I was always wanting to know more about the characters and stories. And even when I was working in television, I found ways to get involved with comics through some of the talent that I would work with or just uh, doing a little side jobs on the on the time for publicity reasons and things like that for other companies right. so it was kind of fun you know but it, it's it was always a learning process and even now you know i mean even after 18 years of dc i still think there's so much more to learn uh, but you know you, you it's when you talk about jim shooter it's it's interesting because i just use him as you know i always but... identify i always uh, i always identify the difference between marvel and dc and if you look at dc uh, they had a very strong editorial staff with all very unique points of view and vision so that's why you could tell the difference between a different editorial group on who was handling what books. Yeah. That's why Superman book 
would feel decidedly different than the world's finest book and the world's finest book would feel different than the Brave and Bold book and so on because they all sat with different editors and they all each editor really had a very strong imprint of their personality on those books. Mm. When you go to Marvel, you have, you have Stan Lee as basically the architect, the primary creator, uh, writer, direction for it, you know, working in conjunction with so many great artists. But, you know, Stan's running, running the ship there. And then after Stan leaves, Roy Thomas takes over and he pretty much just, it's just like passing a baton. They're running a relay race. No, right. he, Roy didn't run in his own direction. He was still running in the same path, which was good. And even when he left, there was this, this cavalcade of editor in chiefs over a short period of time with people just running through that door, but they all maintain the same direction. Right. And then Schroeder comes in and he maintains a direction for the next 10 years. So you have this level of consistency. Yeah. And more importantly, you have an interpretation of the character that comes imprinted on everybody coming in. So even when people come in, they're not going to come in and say, this is the way a character should do, or this, this is what I think he should do. They already know how the character behaves because it's been consistent for so long. DC, not quite as consistent, so it allowed for more input for creators to come in and do their interpretations more so than stick with what the tonality was in a uniform fashion. That's a you fascinating know? point because it may inform the reason why there is there had been over the last 10, 15, 20 years such a vitriolic response when the status quo is shifted. Yeah. I mean, I'm sure, and, and being a comic book fan for so many years in both your and my respect, yeah. uh, you know, you know that the letters pages were curated and I'm sure oh, yeah. there were angry responses back then and it only kind of feels like there are more angry voices today because there is no barrier to entry for those angry voices. Correct. But because of the consistency and because of the like towing of the line, so to speak, there is kind of a continuity of expectations. Mm -hmm. And so it's not that they were used to having their expectations changed. It's more that maybe even though those changes were very gradual and, and almost organic yeah. or against the grain, like it really took a lot of effort to change the status quo. Right, right. And, you know, and, and I mean, right now also the, the starts, the stops and starts and restarts, and it's almost like um, there's no there's no handoff. It is almost it's as I said. It, there's always a feeling. Of, there's always this weird feeling of scorched earth when somebody leaves a book yes. and somebody else coming on. And you know, I, I look back at some old Marvel, and I was just uh, I was just commenting this. I was having a conversation about this just the other day with someone about how you can have a multi part story and have different writers taking different parts of it on an ongoing basis and it would still feel seamless. Yeah. And at that point, it felt like there's a strong editorial direction, but still allows the creators to come in and, and do their thing. But they didn't, nobody tried to drastically change the concept um, as soon as they walked in the door. They came in and really tried to maintain the consistency. And then ultimately, once they got their own comfort with a the character, then they start to put their own brand and voice upon it, you know? Right. And I wonder what that, I wonder what the impetus behind that is. If, it, if it's the creator's trepidation with like, you know, stepping on toes or like pissing off the previous iteration, or if it's more just trying to get comfortable and, and really getting their sea legs. I, I think also, I think a little bit had to do with just the sheer volume of product. There's, there was less books in those days. Yeah. You know, so, you know, I hate to, and I hate to use Spider-Man as a reference, but I'm staring at him behind your back. <laughs> uh, Here, let me get Batman a little right at me. Um, Batman in there. But, yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but one of the things is that, you got to remember a lot of these characters only had one book. You know what I mean? So you yes. didn't really have much room for experimentation. Once you start doing two, three, four versions of a book, then you start to get different interpretations. Like by the time Spider-Man gets the web of Spider-Man, oh, you yeah. know, all, all of a sudden wrong. it's a different, <laughs> it, yeah, exactly. It's a different style book than what Spider-Man was, you know? Yeah. And that's good and bad because then as soon as you start to find those cracks, everybody starts to go for the cracks because Ultimately, that's what interests them. They don't exactly. want to just take on and do the same story everybody else is doing. They really want to find new directions and new ideas. So yeah. it's, it's, it's the yin and yang. It's the constant pull of trying to find that entry level to creativity and still bring some level of consistency. Yeah, you know? and it, it's this level of understanding of the industry and the nuances and the, 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 the pull and push of managing that I think is essential on any level, if you want to get into the comic book industry, if you want to work as an artist, a writer, an editor, whatever it is, you need to understand this. Or I feel like you're going to get some major culture shock. If you oh, yeah. You, the door. you got to, you, you, one of the things, <laughs> I shouldn't say it this way, but one of the things looking to do is, as part of the class is removing that level of fantasy from the conversation. Yes. Um, if you know what I mean, there is a, there is a, a mystique. 
a mystique, you know, and what it is also is that it's that perception. It's, it's that fantasy baseball approach you're just talking about. It's yeah. Like, yeah, so why isn't Neil Gaiman writing five books a month? <laughs> exactly. He's so good. Right, why, he's so why, great. How come you didn't camp? How, why aren't you putting Neil Gaiman on five titles a month? What, why, why, you're not doing your job. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's like, answer that plus everyone else. You know, like, yeah. <laughs> that's, yeah, and that, you know what? And I'm sure you get that question. I'm sure that, like, everyone on it, any level gets that tweet, you, gets you, that, you question. that question. all the time. But or, it's, it's, you know, it's in the best of intentions. Really of course. Okay, they you want know what I mean? And that's, that's the reason why just, you have to give that level of conversation and respect to the question. Right. Even though you want to go, really? <laughs> like, come on. Yeah, you know, the second you're like, sh you're sharing a beer with somebody and then they just go, by the way, you know, I, I have a great way to sell Batman. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If that's, you just get that's, Neil Gaiman and Grant Morris the third the two titles. <laughs> Hey, if anybody could do it, it's Grant. But well, that's, that's true. Precise. But, <laughs> but, but, but on the other side, um, it's it is that it's that balancing, and you're really trying to you're really trying to find the best mix and the best sensibilities, and you know, and not everybody's the best person for every job, and that's the hard part. Right. Too, you know? Yeah. It's it's you know? it's always amazing when you see or when you when you say like, oh man, so and so should write this, and then you go, they did. And you pull out yeah. like the six issue series that they did and it's yeah. like completely forgotten and you read it and you're like, okay, yeah, I guess he wouldn't be a right, the, the right fit for yeah. that character. Yeah, and, the, and the good part is that the, the good and the bad, again, like everything, there's always a, a, a two sides to everything. The good and bad of it right now is that a lot of these writers are in such demand in other media as well. So they are really yeah. picking and choosing uh, what characters and what product they want to work on. Yeah. Uh, so that's good, which means this, if they want to work on it, there's a passion, there's a focus, there's a story in place. On the other side though, that might be it. It might be that snapshot and then they're off to somewhere else. And then you're going to, you're struggling to find somebody else. So you're always constantly trying to find, to fill that hole, trying to fill that gap. Absolutely. Um, you know, as you go forward. I, uh, I noticed that, um, you know, apropos of the, the point I was making earlier about how, uh, you know, you get a lot of voices nowadays, there's an, in, you get an in, inundated with like, with, with the response. Mm -hmm. um, do you, in your experience feel that because of the, 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 the optics of that much response, whether good or bad, uh, dictates the direction of a title? <laughs> um, that's an interesting question. For me, uh, I never wanted to let the online comments dictate anything. Right. Yeah. Um, I think that's a, I think it's a bad precedent was a, was a bad precedent. Absolutely. Um, it's, it's, but that's not to discount conversation or direction or attitude. Right. It's, it's double edged sword. Um, we had him, we had him, uh, we had an expression he used to say, give them what they want, but not what they asked for. <laughs> that, was, that was the expression. Um, and what that means is understand what's driving the question or the angriness. What's mm. driving the aggravation? People make very quick, overarching judgments and statements about things. And if you take them for face value, which a lot of people do, because they, they don't take the time to understand the conversation or, or they don't understand the conversation. They're right. they kind of just, just not part of it. So they understand the superficiality of it and trying to give a superficial response. Right. Um, but if you take the time and pull back and say, okay, this is getting a response. What's that response really about? What's driving that response? Yeah. How deep is it? What can we give them that isn't exactly what they're asking for, but still satisfy their curiosity and interest for what's happening? Yeah, it addresses um, that thing, but maybe yeah. deeper than they understand it to be. Yeah, I think that one of the probably the best writers is that is Jeff Johns, uh, probably at that. He, understand, he understands the core nature of the character so well that he knows how to make those object changes to characters but still feel true to who that character is and that's why he was so successful yeah on so many peripheral characters that people struggle with for an extended period of time right um, you know and i think that's interesting to me um but i always we always you have to stop if you're just doing it because people are responding or you're going let's okay bring this character back because they everybody's complaining yeah you, see, you have to put yeah i said hit the pause button think about what you're doing and think about the long-term ramifications yeah and that was always the conversation if you're going to make a change What's the long-term ramifications? Not just what's the five minutes of the moment that you get that shock value for two seconds and everybody's on to the next thing, but 
What's the long-term ramifications across the line? And if it feeds us more story and creates more opportunity, then I'm willing to take that chance a lot more than if you uh, just did it because it seemed like a good idea at the time. You know? Right. <laughs> How far ahead did you guys plan? Is that fair to ask? It's, yeah, when I, when I used to do a thing with Paul. And what I would do, I still have him. Um, I would see, see the winds kicking in. That's I'm hearing it, yeah. About. Yeah, I'm not, it's I'm punctuating not your point. Yeah, punch exactly. Um, <laughs> I used to do a thing, Paul, which what I would do is I would turn in an overview for the year. This, and, what the, and the overview wasn't just one dictation. It was through conversations, with listening to what everybody had in mind, sure. taking all the stories, playing mix and match, building into one big story, then handing it to football for approval. Then we go back and then we hand it out to everybody and we're off to the races. Right. We, and we did that for like the first five years I was there, five, six years. Up wow. until, yeah. And uh, it, was, it was a good way to keep everybody engaged, to keep the universe moving um and make it feel cohesive and i thought it worked very well uh but it, that gets tired after a while and people start to really start to look to be just more individualistic and as soon as you do it all starts to unravel so mm -hmm. you know this is good and bad to everything so you're always trying different ways to approach things but um you know you know that, that was one of the things i i, I you know i i always joke one of the one of the things when i used to do panels the joke was that i never knew where we were in our story because my <laughs> head was so far so far in the future sure and i'm talking about events you know like oh well this happened this happened everybody would come to me and go well you know we haven't put that book out yet <laughs> <laughs> oh that is good. As, as soon as i'm finished talking about it and i know that people are off working on it i was off to the next thing and you know so i was i was always like that six months to a year ahead of everybody trying to you know to you know cover path so to speak. yeah yeah so, so it listen. sounds like oh no, I was going to say, I was trying to always listen to the bits and pieces floating around because you want to make sure that, you know, the, the, goal, the goal of editorial is more about, uh, reminds, it reminds, what's, the, what's the game, curling? When they sweep, oh, they, they sweep, when they sweep it on the ice and the thing's yeah. sliding down. Yeah, that's what we're sort of doing. We're sort of sweeping the ice in front of the curling ball as it's going down the ice. Sure, just <laughs> I, oh, please, please. <laughs> at the goal. <laughs> Because, yeah, you, you push it, and then that's it. It's up to God now. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So the thing's going, like, so everybody, all the editorials in front of it, sweeping crazily, going, make sure it goes in the right direction. <laughs> wow, yeah. That's funny. Uh, it, it's, it's amazing to me the, uh, the amount of juggling that must go into, not, and I don't want to use that word dictating, but, you know, but curating a line and getting that going. Um, I'm, I'm always, every time that I think about the amount of work that goes into curating a line or working on character or, or, or picking creative teams, I always go back to that Justice League book where it's just the Trinity and they have all the pictures on the table. Yeah, yeah. And they're like, who, you know, who's, who, you know, pros and cons, who we got. Can you tell us a little bit about how, what it's like to go, we're actually in a place where we, need, we get to pick a creative team on a character. Right. What are our options? Um, availability, first of all. Of course. <laughs> but you got to go from a place of, uh, boy, it'd be really cool to get so-and-so. I, I hope they're available. Hope they're available. Hope they're interested. Um, I hope they got a story. Um, and uh, you're late. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> 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 Sorry. <laughs> that, that, I saved that one for the editors. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but uh it's it's you know what it's the, the teams it's it's a lot easier it's because the, the teams are out there always scouring and always looking for people and right. i think they still do you know teams are used to and uh so it was it was interesting to see what people came back with and and something you haven't seen before and you didn't want to go backwards i hate it, i personally hated revisiting things mm. um because if we've already been there then you have something you're going to be judged directly against right and that's the worst thing you can be um it's you know because People's first remembrances are always their best remembrances, no matter how good or bad it is. Right. Um, but you know, it's 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 it, it's it's it is it's it, it's it's fifty two pickup. <laughs> right. For all, for all the purposes, you move it so fast with so many bucks. Um, you know, my funniest story is one of my funniest stories uh, was with uh, Michael Turner. Michael Turner. When Michael Turner came over to DC, oh. and uh, I was so excited we got Michael Turner there, and. I wanted to do a big book with him. I wanted to do something major. And uh, 
So I decided we're going to bring back Carousel Supergirl. I made it. I'm like, we're going to bring back Carousel Supergirl. And I was all excited. And I, I had to go to Paul and, and negotiate. This, this is a big deal. This is the first time we've unraveled one of the big, one of the big tent poles of, of, of Christ on Infinite Earths. We're bringing yeah. back some, we're undoing something major crisis that it held, you know, for, for 20 some odd years. Yeah. And um, so I went to Paul and finally got to it after days. I mean, lots of serious negotiation and a lot of, you know, a lot of hard pushing and hot promises and all these things going on here. Finally get it. And I went to Michael Turner because I didn't want to talk about it beforehand. I didn't want to get his hopes up. So I went oh. to Michael Turner and said, Michael, um, this is it. We're going to bring back Carazel Supergirl. This is a big moment and I want you to do it. And he looks at me and goes, yeah, no, nah, I don't want to do that. <laughs> That sounds like a watered down version of Superman. Yeah, you got something else? <laughs> and like, oh. and I, I was crushed. I was emotionally crushed. Yeah. And I was also in this void. Like, I, I made all these commitments and I don't know what to do now. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> right. Who are you? Oh, well, we got to bring her back now. Who are we going to call? <laughs> but, uh, but, uh, but Jeff Loeb got involved and he, he helped convince Michael it was a good choice. And uh, then he did some of the best work he did at DC Comics. So easily, yeah. It was a win at the end, but I never forgot that moment. I'm like, no, this is. Like, what do you I'm mean, no? Explain, I'm trying to explain what a big deal this is. Yeah, <laughs> I did not plan on that being the answer. <laughs> yeah, no, no, I not at all. wasn't wasn't prepped for that one. <laughs> yeah. Is there anybody that you that you wanted? Like, is there any amount of work you put into something where you're like, okay, I've got this whole plan, I got this whole like pitch, and you say like the first sentence, and they were like, yeah. There was no work to be had. And you were like, Damn, Oh, that's, 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 that's probably happened more times than not. I hate to say it. I hate to say it. That, that's happened more times than not. <laughs> uh, yeah. That, that's, that's, yeah, that's one of those ones because even when I, if, if, if I had said something that came to it, it's not something that was off the top of the head. There was a right. lot of planning and thought behind it, you know, and, it, and a lot of times it's from other conversations too. You know, I would rarely pitch something to someone if I if I, if I had, if I didn't know any of where they stood on it, you know what I mean? I yeah, always had some yeah, background because yeah. every conversation we're having, and you're talking to talent all the time. And you're talking to your staff all the time and you're always absorbing and hearing the bits and pieces and certain words just look, get locked in and certain ideas and certain characters. And, you know, it's, you know, you sit in a room and somebody goes, well, metamorpho. And you go, wait a minute, I was just talking about metamorpho. <laughs> Who are you talking to? That's right. He really likes metamorpho. He wanted to draw it. We didn't have a metamorpho book. Now we got one. Okay, good. And yeah. it sort of comes together, you know? Yeah, definitely. Like that. That's sort of how it all comes in. It's all those conversations. And, you know, and then you, then you, you have all the editors out there constantly, you know, searching and listening and pulling and you bring them into your office and go, what'd you hear from this one? Who wants to do that? And you're constantly hearing everything up because the goal is, which we didn't attain all the time, but the goal is to have people lined up. So when they're finishing a job, you have the next job ready for them because- right. If you're dealing with freelancers, you have to understand as soon as their book is done, they're unemployed. Exactly. So they're going to have to find work. And most of the time they're looking for work while they're working for you. Right. Um, so your job is if you want to keep them, give them that work so that it takes the pressure off the end of the book they're working on so they can concentrate on the work, knowing clearly they'll have something else coming. Yeah. So it's always that you want to, you're always scouring to find out when you know a project ending or somebody's looking to move on. And if it's somebody you want to keep to have that next book waiting for them so you don't lose that talent. Yeah. So, do you find that because of the nature of the industry today versus any other time <laughs> in history that, because uh, I know that you've been attributed to saying something to the effect of, you know, I took a lot of shit, paraphrasing, of course, uh, that was earned and unearned, but it was your job yeah, like, totally. to take it. Yeah. Uh, Remember, I'm responsible for everything bad DC did, nothing good. Exactly. You've never done a good thing for DC. So if, you know. if, 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 a good thing, if a good thing happened, it was accidental or I stayed out of the mix. Exactly. If it, if it wasn't good, I was completely hands on. I'm right. That was, that. yeah, because <laughs> it can't be. Yeah, it can't be both. It can't be that you're like this puppeteer and then accidentally something else happened over here that was so sweeping that people, everyone enjoyed it. Yeah, that's okay. It's all good. But no, I'm just, it's, it, it's but uh, you know, it, it's, it's interesting. Just, it, I'm, I'm glad that you're, you have a sense of humor about it because uh, I can't imagine how frustrating that must be on a daily basis. I, you know, it, it, it is, look, it, it is what it is. You know, you know I, grew, I grew up, in, uh, I grew up in, in Brooklyn. A lot of my, my, a lot of my friends, uh, people I know dearly, work in jobs that they just hate, yeah. you know? Um, I've been fortunate enough and, and blessed enough to be able to work in areas that I absolutely love. 
So the aggravation that comes in a job that you love compared to a job you hate is completely different. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, so um, if that's the price to pay for having an experience in a job like this, um, it doesn't even, it's not, it doesn't even tip the scale. Right. <laughs> you know what I mean? Oh uh, yeah. Getting chewed out at work <laughs> for just operating like a forklift <laughs> is yeah. way worse and, you know, than, you know, and, a couple and, of people and, tweeting and, at you and, about and, and by the way, I also know how important are books to people that, that are uncomfortable at doing jobs just because they have to pay a salary. Right. Um, so that's why you have to take what they say honestly yeah. um, and, and understand how important this is to them because this is valuable to them. So you never want to discount anybody. Um, and you, and you know what, and as my expression is always to what end to, to argue certain things out to what end, um, what, what are you really trying to accomplish? Um, if it's to make myself feel better, that's okay. I feel fine. <laughs> you know, <laughs> good. That's fair. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> right. Um, there's a uh, man, I don't know. Uh, we go in any direction. I'm just trying to think. Like, I know I want to, I want to really want to tailor it to what you're doing now because I really want to yeah, like, I mean, I like it's, it's, it's one of the, well, because nobody really knows what I'm doing now. That's the kind of the fun. I part. know, but there's um, rumors. I hear you might be working on a book. You know, there's some stuff. Yeah. I mean, look, you know, the big one for me is, you know, the first thing for Rust is that I'm, uh, you know, I'm wrapping up. I, I, actually, I just, I, I just turned in the final pages uh, to issue 12 of, of Metal Man. Yes. I had a great experience. Um, I was so happy to be working with Shane Davis. He did a beautiful job on this book. He's bringing it to a wonderful conclusion and he stayed on it all the way through, which is yeah. fabulous because it showed a level of commitment that, that, that you, can only, you can always ask for from, a, from somebody you collaborate with. So that's been great. Uh, the art has been fun. Um, it's interesting because originally, you know, I, I thought of it by more, so we sort of jammed a lot of stuff in at the end. Yeah. But at the end of the day, I'm really happy with that. And <laughs> probably, you know, it's, it's funny. You know, ever since I got to D, ever, from the moment I got to DC to the moment I left, people always ask me, what's your favorite character? Who's your favorite character? You know, and, and you can never answer. Okay, I can say it now. Metal Men are my favorite characters. <laughs> Hand down, without a doubt, they are my favorite. Now I can say it. <laughs> That's fair. <laughs> I had I a suspicion. Love, I absolutely love those characters. I could write those characters forever. That's how much I love them so dearly. And uh, so, you know, when I knew this was coming to an end, I wanted to get as much in as possible. And right. I, it was great because Shane came up with a couple of ideas in there that really allowed me to, to, to just put some crazy stuff in there. And uh, it's just been, it's been a wonderful experience. And it's, it's, a, it's, if you know what, if, you, if you're looking for something to cap and to finish up on, then, you know, hey, it's good. And, you know, it's, it's, it's been a good experience. And That's it's, true. Kind of, it's kind of a nice closure. It's interesting. Um, it's interesting for me because I think the, my last issue of Metal Men will come out around the same time my first issue with Superboy came out before I wow. started, when I first started. Uh, literally 19 years, it's almost to the month. And uh, that's, uh, that's a, it's, it's a little, uh, you know, it's a, yeah. <laughs> it's a little melancholy here or there. You'll have to admit it, but, uh, but it's, it's, it's kind of, it's kind of fun. It's kind of fun. It's a good thing. That's really sweet. Know? Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I love, I love your Superboy story. I don't want to waste it. Cause I know it's somebody that's you, <laughs> but man, <laughs> Yeah, the, yeah well, Super Story was crazy. How I, it was interesting because, again, you know, it was wonderful to hear people trying to equate my Superboy writing experience to me getting a job as vice president of editorial <laughs> and trying to find yeah, the that works. <laughs> <laughs> and, of course, they were completely independent of each other, which is wonderful. But the, the conspiracy theorists out there were trying to find out how the two were connected. Right. And, and I tried to, never tried to discourage them from coming up with that connection. Um, <laughs> But, but it was it was the two separate events and again working with Jimmy Pamiotti when I first worked in I mean he, he was he's, he's what probably one of my closest friends longest friends in the comic business even just friends overall um, we used to live in the same building back in Brooklyn in the mid 80s you Aww. know yeah I used to I used to watch I knew he was a comic guy because he used to walk around with the big art portfolios mm -hmm. um, and then there was a local store a few blocks from our house that we met in and uh, became friends there and we we submitted work after work and uh it was funny we um you know i was trying to break in and like he was my entry point you know and he was yeah. also he also got um comp boxes that i was he let me read on occasion <laughs> too so double win but yeah. uh but, <laughs> but we were trying to break in we, we actually had a couple submissions in uh back in the old days with uh, marvel 2099 oh uh, we, turned in, we turned about two or three 2099 stories Turned in a Ravager 2099, a Rhino 2099. We turned in a bunch of stuff. Sure. And uh, almost got there, never really clicked. 
And after a while, though, Jimmy had some success with uh, uh, Deadpool over at Marvel. And, yeah. then, and we had sent in a Guardian pitch at DC. Um, it was rejected. But then after a success at Deadpool, they reached out to Jimmy again. And we dusted off the Guardian, brought it back. <laughs> and somehow, in the course of the conversation, the Guardian pitch became us becoming the regular writers <laughs> on Superboy. <laughs> yep. <laughs> so... Yeah, and Guardian got completely cut out because completely of completely cut out. Yeah, they just they loved everything about the pitch. Ex- they loved everything about the Guardian pitch except the Guardian. <laughs> right, because <laughs> they're just looking for an excuse. Okay, we'll just yeah. And then I remember Jimmy to this day. Just go with it. Just go with it. Right. Stop just you're, yes. just, you're in. Stop it. <laughs> right. Don't argue. That's great. Yeah, I'm not going to re- recommend that type of approach when I'm talking to kids in this classroom, but no. still, I mean, I'm going to tell them if it does occur, take it. <laughs> well, and it's, it, it's funny, I've, I've heard, you know, there are a thousand great stories about how people breaking in, but the thing that you never really hear, and I hear it every once in a while, is, well, you know, I got, when I got my foot in the door, I closed it behind me. Like, they're not yeah. going to fall for the same trick again. Yeah, yeah. And, that, and that's the thing, too. You've got to realize that opportunities can come at you from so many different ways. Yeah, but it might only come once. So if you're waiting for that sweet spot or that sweet moment, well, you know what? They didn't offer me Batman, so I'm just going to wait until that come opportunity comes around. <laughs> that might not show. You got you got to prove your value and worth. You got right. to prove your dependability. Uh, you got to prove prove your uh, collaborative nature. Um, you got to show your ingenu- ingenuity without completely reinventing the wheel. There's so many different things that are all taking events, but the one thing you have to prove more than else is most of the guys, the one story he'll most is, yeah, they needed a script by tomorrow. <laughs> right. You know, and, yeah. and that's the real job. That's the thing that I, that, that's what I gleaned from it, from, from years of, of watching folk like you just talk uh, for like, you know, about the industry is like, can you produce? Because that's like priority one. Yeah. You know? Yeah. I mean, the, 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 the <laughs> it's a funny story. When uh, you, I used to have a running, running thing when I used to get the solicitations and I'm proofing over the solicitations and you see one name, one name in there more prominently mm-hmm. than you see anybody else. And my first question is, when did he visit the office? Because normally what happens is that if you see somebody in a three or four books in the same month, that means he must've did a walkthrough and everybody, and everybody who's in trouble <laughs> started throwing him work. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's been killed by the pandemic you don't get those guys walking around the halls so no they, they, there's something incredibly fun about seeing the talent walking through the halls going in the doorways yeah you know i mean it's it's it was almost like this weird rite of passage they come in they visit with in my office we chat for a little while then they go through editorial then they swing by on the way out and i'd always ask them like what's in your goodie bag yeah <laughs> I got an eight. Page, I got an eight-page backup. I got a fill-in. I got, I got a yep. couple of great. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Well, I'm, I know I'm not your last stop today. <laughs> I I I am. I love the stories about the office being an office, like being a place of collaboration, and it be. I mean, you know, like you you talked about the fantasy element of the industry, yeah. where people assume that there's just all these drafting tables, and like everyone's just producing books, like in the yeah. office. It's like no, it's a, it's an office, but that you do see like the talent walks, like, the, you know, there's meetings, there's, there's, you know, summits, there's all kinds of different collaboration going on and hearing that the, that the office is a place of, of creativity and, yeah. and, and inspiration. Yeah, there, there was a moment, there was a moment during uh, countdown to infinite crisis. We were finalizing the design. We didn't have a final design for, um, for the Omax. Right. Uh-huh. Um, and I remember Phil Jimenez, in the office sketching literally filling it in because the book had to be shipped he's literally drawing the pages in the office <laughs> and i want i want to say it was joey cavalieri or somebody did the design that phil wound up working from but it was something it was just this weird thing everybody's scrambling there's no greater moment in time um for me than when you see that creative energy that collaboration that's a great moment the other great moment is when a page comes in that's so exciting that the editor takes and shows it to everybody else yeah. You know what I mean? And yeah, that's another moment because, you know, everybody's so jaded, but you get that one page that they're so excited by. They can't wait to show it to you. Yeah. I'm like, Holy shit. <laughs> uh, that, that's like, that's, a, that's like a, that's, that's just, that's just, just fun stuff. You know, yeah. that's good stuff. Yeah. You, you talked about design. I was just curious because you've been there and you, you, you were actually, you, you were working during two different logo changes. Uh, what's your favorite DC logo? Uh, it's an interesting, um, 
You know what? It's you, you always pick what you first know. I mean, I, a lot I of people assume, know yeah. Blazer one. Yeah, for me, there's something enjoyable about the DC line of superstars that I've always loved. <laughs> yeah. I don't know why. It's just, it's just, it just is because I think at that moment in time, I always refer to that because what was key to me uh, was that um, there was. There was so, you know, DC in the 70s, only 40% of their product was superheroes. That means the majority of material was non-superhero comics. Yeah. That's, that showed me a real comic company in a weird way. Yeah. Um, it wasn't really until the direct market comes on board that says, we just want superheroes. Right. That everybody starts to just focus in on, on just the same type of product, which forced us then to overproduce the limited number of material and product we had, because that's why everything feels a lot more redundant. Right. Um, because we lost a lot of genres that allowed different flavors, different types, and also different voices, um, which I think that's one mm. of the limited. I think now we're starting to get a good diversity of voices back into the books. Again. Agreed. But yeah, but that's, that's that. I mean, you know, you know, I, I can't, I can't say enough early days for me too. Um, my, uh, my uh, a person that I relied very heavily on uh, was Mark Chiarello in those days, early when I first got there, he was, he was the visual interpretation of DC comics for, for, for the majority of my time there. Mm. Um, you know, it really was his style and sensibilities and his um, art design and really brought so much to have so much we had going on. Um, I think that's, uh, you know, that was, uh, that was things, you know, but then again, I've been, I've been very fortunate, you know, work, I work with guys like Mark Rill, I work with guys like Jim Lee, you know, yeah. I don't have to worry about art. Right. You know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. About the, the visual style and identity of the company. You know what I mean? Because, the, because there were so many people so qualified in that and that way we really could just hunker down and yeah. just talk story and characters and just, you know, I love talking characters. You know, you were talking before about just that bullpen and that was the thing I lost. Oh yeah. There's a, there's a, there's one page of art that if I ever wanted to own a single page of art, it's a Stanley Jack Kirby piece of art from, I want to say fantastic four annual five, something like that. They did a, a goofy little story in the back. It's a, I think it's something low. There shall be a plot or something. I forgot the name of the title, but mm -hmm. it's Stan with a helmet on, you know, you know, pretending acting out a scene across his desktop everybody's running in fear they're all trying to scream about trying to get the book out kirby's there in the corner drawing <laughs> it's just a sheer chaos and for me that's the snapshot of what making comics was about and that was the template you know and you know i've always remembered that creative energy i was very i'm fortunate enough to not just work in comics but also work several years in animation yeah and i've always been able to surround myself by incredibly more talented than myself people um and i just love feeding off their energy and their craziness and it's you know and it's that it's that collaboration was what makes everything we get that's what's so that's what's a shame about a lot of what goes on now everybody is so individualized and unique yeah. and personalized about their personal vision and it really is truly a collaborative business and once you lose the collaboration i think you lose some of the energy yeah. What it is. You got to be, if you can work together and create things together with people. Then I think ultimately what you're going to do is you're going to find it be uh, better off. Of, I think, I think we are truly, um, we're so much, we're, we're stronger together than it work as individuals. I, I agree. Especially in yeah. this industry, you know, well, you get so many different ideas, so many different perspectives. And, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, yeah. That's, that's, that's the fun stuff. I mean, the best, the most, I mean, that's also part of the problem with comics too, um, is that so many people are throwing ideas in, that when something succeeds, you're not really sure whose idea it is because in some cases, because there's so many people had a hand in it. I think that's the good and the bad in a weird way. Cause yeah. then, you, know, you know, especially when, you know, accreditation and so much stuff is being used in multiple directions. Yeah. You know? um, and I think the editors get a shorthand, uh, short rift on this because ultimately they have so much input and so much say in a lot of things going on. But reality mm -hmm. is uh, they're, they're invisible when it comes to any of the, uh, any of the processes. Uh, yeah once it starts to move outside the books themselves, you know? Right. Right. Oh, man. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's just, it is fantastic. Uh, and so can you tell me what is, what is the class? Like, what, what do we, what are you going to get out of it? Like, besides okay, so just, it's is, not, we, I assume it's not just gonna be like, hang out with Dan to deal for an hour. And like, no, 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 no. What I'm hoping to do is um, bring a structure to their logic and sensibilities. Uh, approach the creativity in a somewhat orderly manner okay. in regards to just what the what type of product you need to turn at certain levels for certain levels of its expectation, how you're presenting your material, uh, making themselves aware of a room, what happens in a room when you're pitching, not pitching, um, and approaching it from two ways. How do you how do you approach and try to create for work for hire? 
how do you approach and try to create, create our own? And realistically, um, more importantly, um, through this whole process, I'm hoping at the end of it, uh, each one of the classmates uh, will, will pitch me their project and I'll give them a sense. Uh, what I will tell them is that nobody has guaranteed pitches to win. I have a, <laughs> you know, nothing to win. I have a, a whole house full of rejection letters that shows me that obviously I don't know the true answer myself, <laughs> uh, but it is to better prepare them um, on a very top, top line view of, of what the business they're stepping into. That's right. really um, people can help them really help build storytelling or craft or, or structure or script structure or art. And, and um, what I'm really looking to do is contextualize right. uh, the business aspect of it in a way that um, still plays to the creativity that they bring to the room. That is, uh, I, I live like three miles away from the Joe Kubert school. So I've, I've been growing up there. Like I, I took summer classes there. Yeah. Uh, and, and I understood, or I always thought, you know, because I, of course, I remember seeing it in the comic book ads myself. And first of all, being like, who the hell's Tor? But yeah. then being like, okay, oh my God, I know that town. I've been in that town. And then going yeah. there and assuming that that place, like, was the gateway into the comic book industry. And so many different artists and, uh, that you've heard of and that, you, that, you, that people aspire to be uh, have gone through that, those doors. And I, I love knowing that you're adding this element to this, to this institution and giving it the, con the context that I think a lot of people don't really understand they need. Because I think people think that, you know, you just, you just do, you check off a couple of boxes and then you know what, what to do. Or if you're, if you're just a great artist or you're just a yeah. brilliant writer, success will follow. And it's like, you, hope ideally, sure, <laughs> you know, but yeah. at the same time, understanding the industry, understanding the structure can get, because I'm sure you have gotten a thousand terrific ideas that you know were from someone who couldn't execute them or yeah. who didn't understand enough of the industry to be able to articulate it to the point where you're like, I could get and turn this into a product. Yeah, and, that, and, that's, and that's important right now because ultimately, you know, the problem is so much of what's being created now is being done with media in mind. Yeah. Oh, God. Okay. So they're foregoing, they're creating something, what I believe has false value, meaning they're creating a comic as a pitch tool more so than as a sales tool. Yes. And I always say, you got to learn how to walk before you run. Um, make sure your stuff works. Don't worry about your sequels. Don't worry about your franchise. Don't worry about how all your spinoffs. Don't worry about the films. Don't worry about everything else. If you're going to make a comic, make a comic that works because ultimately you're, this is what you're going to be judged against. Right. Um, and if the comic isn't good because you're right, focused on somewhere else, then you're going to miss an opportunity even if you have a good idea on the table. Yeah. So that's part of the process, part of the conversation. I mean, there's a, there's a, there are so many ways to publish now. This isn't just about publishing for DC and Marvel. This has been publishing for, for Boom and Dark Horse. This is for everything. This is for, yeah. It's, you've got Kickstarter. You've got Webtoons. you got everything out there but also the only thing they see and all they hear about are the successes right. and the exceptions, successes are the exceptions to the rule. Yeah. You know what I mean? So oh, absolutely. If you keep on working. If you keep on working your plan to an exception, ultimately you are going to be met with failure more than success. Yeah. So honestly, you've got to understand what the rules are. And once you understand the rules, you work to the rules. And then once you've got them perfected, then you can become the exception. Right. Right. It, it's, it's not unlike, uh, what was it in literature? You know, I, I have a literary background, but like one of my literary criticism classes was all about like, it was just writers yelling at each other through prose saying essentially you can, you need to understand the rules before you can break them. Yeah. And yeah. that's so valuable across the board. And I think especially in comics because yeah. Kickstarter has Kickstarter and crowdfunding has, a, has created this interesting bypass to knowledge and understanding of the industry because you can have the success without having to go through the work, you know? Oh, absolutely. And they, they, this, I can't tell you how many new writers I've met that wanted to tell me about their brand. And I look at them and I used to say, you're a brand new writer, your brand is writing. Not a to you, if you are limiting yourself to this slice of an audience because you have 10 people online telling you how wonderful you are right. in that slice, you are limiting yourself, you're limiting your craft, and you're going to be find yourself very short, having a very short career. Because the yeah. reality is once you over 
play your hand in one area and you get typecast, it's going to be hard to grow out of that. Yeah. So your goal as a young writer should be as wide as possible and cast the net as wide as possible rather than narrow casting yourself to a very small group that's feeding your ego or your bank book for a moment. Um, yeah. So it really is what your commitment is and your long-term commitment is and what's the long game. Yeah. Um, so much is done now, even how businesses run and so many things run quarter to quarter. And my goal is to talk to people to start to project out career paths for two, three years in their future so that they have goals to set for themselves moving forward that aren't limited to what's going to happen next month, you know? Yeah. Well, uh, I, I, I have so much more, but I fear if we do, it'll be another hour and I don't want to take up more of your time. No, no worries. No I'd love worries. to, you know, I'd, I would rather just turn into another episode. So if, if you're <laughs> okay, down, no I'd love to have you back. Um, cause there's so much more that you've been at and heading towards that I would love to pick your brain about. Yeah, the, 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 good, the, the, the best thing I can tell you right now is the joy is being able to pick and choose what you want to do. Um, and work yeah. with the people you want to work with. And there's some people that I really enjoy uh, collaborating with that, that I've been in touch with, which has been fun, not just in comics, but in, but in from my days in television and things like that. Yeah. And you got a chance to reconnect with some, some old stalwarts of mine, which is kind of nice. Um, that is nice. You know, it is. Yeah, it's, it's been fun. It's been, it's been good. You know, I, as I, as I, as the best way I could say it is that when, because uh, this happened to me before, I always say when you, when you leave something, you feel like you're, you're standing at the station and you're watching the train leave and you you feel like you're not there for the ride anymore and you're just wondering where am I supposed to go from here. Yeah. Uh, it was kind of helpful to me that the, when the, the train started to leave at a station, it sold halfway down the tracks and it hasn't moved. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm actually sitting there going, wow, I'm glad I'm not on the train. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh my God. Not going I have a little more freedom here. <laughs> right. Well, it's been good. Uh, when is the class and how can people find out more about it slash well, the, the interesting thing about it is um fun thing about it, it's a small group it's a small group we had the first class sold out within uh within the, the, the almost almost from when it, from, when it, from when it launched so much yeah. so that we had the second class and that one's filled up right now and if this goes well and uh i get a good yelp review no i'm kidding uh, <laughs> rate my professor <laughs> yeah i gotta make sure i get a good yelp say yeah. um uh, then we'll probably look to do it again, but uh, but I'm, I'm I'm working with the school in, on an advisory level, some places, so um, advisory board, and so it's 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 you know like I said, I think um, the strength of the school is important to the industry in my mind. So there's yeah. so many great schools out there between SBA and and Savannah, Christy, and Sal. Yeah. There's a lot of great things out there. You know, a lot of these great programs, and whatever we can do to help prop these programs up to get new young talent in um, with a fresh set of eyes, because we need younger voices. We need um, new sensibility, fresh set of eyes, so that we're not just revisiting our past and just living in nostalgia, but really moving an industry forward. Yeah. You know? And creating something new for someone else to, you know, exactly. reminisce about. That's, what I mean. that's, that's the joy of it all. You know, I, I want to be surprised by what I read. You know, I, yeah. I want to, I, I, I want to be excited and, and anticipate what's going on. I mean, I'm watching that show, uh, Raised by Wolves on, uh, on, on HBO Max, yeah. and, and I have to say, um, it's fascinating to me because you know it's it's a hard show to anticipate where it's going, right? Um, which I think is wonderful, um, and yeah. but it's true to itself. So that when you do get scenes that pay off, they are very respectful of everything came before, so it all makes contextual sense. Right. That's that's ultimately the goal of any storyteller is to be able to craft something that keeps the person on the edge of their seat. But the complete experience is very satisfying because you never felt you were spoken down to or tricked along the way. Right. So that's that's what we're trying. You know, anything if we can accomplish that and bring it back to comics and stop doing it everywhere else, yeah, uh, then we Come win. On. You know. <laughs> <laughs> Dan, uh, thank you so much. Where uh, where can people get more from you personally? Is there is there you know? A website, Twitter, anything you want to plug, or is it uh, you just, know, I, you know, uh, leave me alone. Like just, I'm, not a, I'm not a huge. It's I'm not a, as, you, as it took me trying to figure out how to make Zoom work. I'm not a huge, uh, you know, I have a Facebook presence. I have a Instagram presence. Um, but I try to keep it very, um, uh, very limited uh, to what's going on right now. You know, right. only because um, I, I get bored talking about myself. <laughs> I, just, I, get, I, just, I don't know, man. I see what I'm doing every day. I said, I don't know who the hell cares what I'm doing all day. Like, right. Uh, you know. <laughs> That's fair. I, I'm in the same boat. I put it up there for sure. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Well, thank you so much, man. And it was great having you. And we'll see you guys next week on all new episode. Amazingly. Yeah, thanks. And thanks cool. for the invitation. Good luck with it all, man. Thanks, Dom. Thank you. Thank you. Bye then.